let me get started. And see. Yeah, maybe uh, two books I wanted to tell you about, um, if, if you don't know about it. One is Zen Ritual by uh, Stephen Hine and Dale Wright, edited by them. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. It's uh, hard going in some places, it's, but it's got, it's, it's edited, it's a collection of articles. Uh, and the other, which I think is a fantastic book, is called Bringing Zen Home by Paula Arai. Oh, she's in that ritual that she she's in, you went over yes, yesterday. Actually, that, that's one of the good pieces in that. Paula Arai, uh, uh, this is basically uh, healing. The, the blurb says, healing lies at the heart of Zen in the home. As Paula Arai discovered in her, rich, in her pioneering research on the ritual lives of Zen Buddhist laymen lay women mm -hmm. in Japan. And it's about healing rituals, and it's about the creation of these rituals. Uh, that the sort of improvisation, again, from building blocks, but blocks, that, you know, but pieces that are adapted for, uh, by, by, and for women. Not like adapted by Soto Shu, as a practice that they gave them, but actually as a living practice that uh, that Paula lived and researched. She's, uh, did you know her? Yeah. Yeah, she's no, a great, really wonderful person. And she comes to the Bay Area from time to time. Uh, so she's doing workshops. She's going to be, actually, she's going to be the speaker at the next uh, Soto Zen Buddhist Association meeting. Uh, which some of you attend, and by then maybe more of you will attend. Well, associates can attend, and I highly recommend that priests go yeah. um, now that they're allowing the associates to attend more meetings yeah. Yeah. and not and not shovel, shunting them off mm -hmm. to their own meetings while we discuss the good stuff. <laughs> they're including them in all the discussions, even if they can't vote. Mm -hmm. So it's a good it's a good thing. To they're do. not a lot of votes. I'm on the board. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, I wanted to just make you aware of those two books. I, I think Paula's book is extraordinary. I mean, it's a real, it's not a collection of, of essays, it's actually a, a book. Um, so, coming back to this question of you know, the tension between, if you will, the tension between self-power and other power. Uh, there's a famous case, which I'm sure many of you know. A monk asked Zhao Zhou, how should I use the 24 hours? Zhao Zhou said, you are used by the 24 hours. This old monk uses the 24 hours. What time are you talking about? Um, What's the question, actually, what's the difference between you and me from the one to Joshi? Not in the version I read. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, but there, there may be versions. Yeah, different versions, uh, yeah. It's like, how, how is a teacher different from the students? So right, like, right. That is, it's a little, you know, there's a different element added in there, but uh -huh. it's essentially the same story. Yeah, it's the same, the same story. story, yeah. You know, and to me, what gets what I'm thrown back on by that uh, dialogue is uh, okay. Am I being used or am I using? You know, am I? Uh, yeah, you could easily. Uh, you could also respond the other way around uh, and think uh, and say. Well, I think of myself as using the 24 hours, and the teacher said, you're using the 24 hours, I'm used by the 24 hours. <laughs> that would also be, you know, there would be a point to that as well. Uh, so we don't want to necessarily draw this line, but to use the 24 hours, I think, is uh, to contextualize one's life 
in a sense, if we're talking about Zen as ritual, that your whole life is a ritual. Uh, one of the really good piece in, uh, that I like in, in the Hein Wright book uh, is by Tygen Layton uh, in our lineage uh, about Zazen as, the, as ritual enactment uh, and looking at its formal context, its location, and, and the activity itself. So, um, I want to read, did you all read, read a definition of ritual? I did, but you should say it again because this is, we're uh, just opening up the topic and it needs to go in a bunch of times. Right. <laughs> so, different, so here's a definition uh, from Catherine Bell, who's one of the uh, yeah. primary modern theorists of ritual from a, for, and from a religious uh, background. Uh, ritual is a stereotyped sequence of activities involving gestures, words, and objects performed in a sequestered place and designed to influence preternatural entities or forces on behalf of the actor's goals and interests. Could you say it again? Yeah. <laughs> that, that la that last, the last clause, it's tricky, I'll, I mean, you know, definition, but okay, ritual is a stereotyped sequence of activities. It means one that isn't a, a regular sequence that's repeatable, involving gestures, words, and objects performed in a sequestered place, if you will, a, a sacred space. You know, something that sequestered, separated out, separated off from uh, our normal activities, and designed then designed to influence preternatural natural entities. Pre Does she say both? Preternatural and natural? No, she doesn't actually. Uh -huh. uh, which what? is a shortcoming yes. of this definition to me. Uh -huh. uh, preternatural entities and forces on behalf of the actor's goals and interests. Huh. Uh, preternatural means beyond, what's that, what's that mean? It's, oh, yeah, it's sort of beyond beyond uh, natural. Uh, it's sort of like supernatural, yeah. yeah. Um, she doesn't make it sound like action here. Are the actors? On behalf of the actors. On behalf of the actors. Huh. No, the entities are, you know, they're going to help. It's just like... It's like it's asking just, for, yeah. please. Help it's us. like... Help us. Help us. Help us. Entities is a weird yeah. word there. But... Uh, anyway, let's see. Yeah, let's, I mean, it's, it's just like this. Uh, it. May all the Buddhas and ancestors of the yeah, Kingdom yeah. of Way be compatible uh -huh. with this. Right, it's yeah. totally like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so the word, the word ritual uh, is, is an English word deriving from the Latin uh, ritus, which means. Um, in legal usage, it was a, a legal term and a, and a religious term. And uh, it was, it indicated the way of doing something uh, or the correct performance of an activity. Uh, and it has, a Ve it has a Sanskrit root. Uh, in the Vedic religion, uh, Rita, uh, means uh, literally the visible order. Uh, and it says, the lawful and regular order of the normal and therefore proper natural and true structure of cosmic, worldly, human, and ritual events. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Which reminds me of, you know, we're talking with uh, a monk friend of ours uh, from the Theravada tradition, and we were talking about sila, mm -hmm. uh, which is precepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, well, what it really translates into is uh, natural normalness, or normal naturalness. Mm -hmm. Sila? Sila. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is the nat, when you uncover 
when you remove greed, hatred, and delusion, sila is the is the quality of action, which is uh, in keeping with this uh, the definition of right or ritual here, right? Which which speaks to our question earlier about desiring the natural order of mind. Right. What does that mean? Yes. So it's always playing with, we're playing with form and emptiness, you know, with uh, the form, the correct form, the natural form, uh, which is ultimately empty. It's just the, I mean, in a ritual, there's no one thing to the ritual that you can point to as the ritual. So if we look at uh, if we look at Jukai, as we'll, we'll do later, you know, it's like uh, there's no one thing you can say point to is like, oh, okay, this is the Jukai. You know, uh, it's the whole uh, sequence of activities that is transformational. Uh, so I think about this a lot because of the name that uh, I was burdened with by my teacher. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, in our tradition, we're given two names. Uh, I don't know if that's true for, for all of you. Uh, we're given a way name, uh, a first name, uh, and then the second name, which is two characters, and the second name, which is two characters, which is a Dharma name. Uh, a way name, in a sense, represents, sometimes you could say it represents characteristics that are already uh, semi-manifest, and you can see in somebody. Uh, uh, so, my way name is very nice, it's very conventional, Dharma Mountain, you know, it's like, well, that's pretty good. You know, I don't know, it's kind of the one that I use. Now, a Dharma name that he gave me is Kushiki. And if uh, you're studying the Heart Sutra, right? Yeah, so Ku, there's always, there's all this Ku and Shiki in the Heart Sutra. Ku is emptiness, formlessness, and Shiki is form. What? Form. form. Emptiness. Yes. You got it all. Mr. Formless Form. <laughs> <laughs> a big blob. <laughs> um, that was, a, it was, you know, really challenging when I, when I got the name. And what he, at the time, I think the, the meaning of that name was, don't be stuck on forms. Because I was very stuck on forms. And uh, and I was liable to tell you if I thought you weren't doing it right. Uh, because I knew, uh, which I did. Uh, so he gave me this name as, as a admonition to, to let go. But then, like every name, which is one of the wonderful things about names in any, in any uh, language, uh, one can grow into one's name. Uh, and I think that in certain ways, the way the name has led me is to be able to understand the manifestation of form in the formless shape of my life and the manifestation of formlessness in the formal dimension of life so that one can develop a fluid ability to move back and forth. And I think that gets to what I want to communicate as uh, something at the heart of rituals. Like how do we, uh, how do we live in such a way that's, uh, that's fluid? You know, without being rigid or stuck on a form, but to, uh, but to be fluid with it. So there's also another thing, I'll, another point to this.
this. You know, uh, I'm thinking a lot. Uh, I don't know how many of you read uh, Rev Anderson's book, Being Upright. Yeah, which is really good. Uh, and there's some challenging stuff in it, and there may be stuff that you like or don't like. But uh, Rev's translation of do you know the pure precepts? When we take, mm -hmm. when we go through the ceremony today, this more this, this afternoon, we'll talk about the sixteen bodhisattva precepts, the three refuges, the three pure precepts, and then the ten uh, grave precepts. So the three pure precepts, uh, often we chant them as uh, to avoid all evil, do all good. Is that what you do? Yeah, and to save the many beings. That's one gate. That's one gate. Oh, the what? You look, you look alarmed. She does. I, I am glad you're talking about this because I've often been confused about this. Right. What, what did you say to them? Well, when I was at Tassajara, all of a sudden, one of the full moon Bodhisattva ceremonies out comes, you will follow the forms and the rules and regulations. Yeah, and I went. Mm. I, did, I forgot to clap because I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to be clapping. <laughs> 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 Kosho, yeah, Kosho said that, and I thought, I don't know where we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, we went to the Catholic Church for a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it's a good idea to have the ceremony be very different. Yeah. Yeah. So, the derivation of those precepts comes from the uh, comes from the Theravada, from the three. Uh, Forgetting what they're called in, in Theravada, but uh, those three vows are matters of this. Of, they're very simple: avoid all evil, do all good, purify your mind. That's that's what it is in in the Theravada. In the Mahayana, the last one got translated from purify your mind to uh, save save all sentient beings, uh, because your mind does not belong to you. It's, it's a big mind. Uh, in the Soto liturgy, uh, Soto Shu liturgy, uh, Soto school, uh, the first pure precepts, as Rev translates it, is embrace and sustain forms and ceremonies. Mm -hmm. It is the abode, the source, and the law of all Buddhas. I hadn't thought about that second part. We, so uh, when we do the when we do the full moon ceremony, we say, uh, "I vow to avoid all evil." It is the abode, the source, and the law of all Buddhas. Uh, actually, if you think about it, if you think about the meaning of a law, you realize that Rebs. The version that he got from Sotatru, it makes sense. And again, I was talking with with Kaz uh, the other day, and his translation of that is uh, a pretty literal translation from Sotatru. It's observe all precepts. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I don't know what the actual language is, but uh, what Reb says in his commentary, by wholeheartedly embracing and sustaining the forms and ceremonies of Zen practice, you abandon the self-centered way of living, which is the source of all evil. Uh, comments? It makes a little more sense. I can understand where I can understand it's sort of like a come down or something. It's like let's just obsess about our little forms because like evil's way over there and we have to yeah, worry about that really and yeah. or something. I mean, that's yeah. kind of where that you tiny. go. Yeah, yeah, it's tiny, small. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, limited. But within the context of um, this is something within the context of monastic life. Mm -hmm. I think this is a monastic vow. Uh, it's emphasizing what our essential activity is there. That's, it's, 
it's the way in which we enter and can do can get caught in evil or get or or do well. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the same when I heard it. I I think I virtually threw the book down. You know, <laughs> um, and then you know I thought there's something going on here. You know, there's something that I need to pay attention to and understand more because I'm having a big reaction. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. it, well, it, I haven't mm -hmm. read Paula's book, yeah. but isn't in Paula's book the very kernel of these women have created their own ceremonies to some extent, but it's in order to do this. Is yeah. It, is it not? Yes. yes. It's in order to, to ritualize. Yes. Uh, and there's various aspects. The thing is, there's various aspects of uh, of ritual. You know, there's a formalism, there's traditionalism, uh, there's connecting, there's defining. Uh, if you look at uh, some anthropologists uh, are saying, you know, would say, would argue that actually ritual, the structuralists would say, ritual is uh, an expression of the actual structure of your mind. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's a recapitulation of uh, cognitive uh, yeah. activities, mm -hmm. which right. which may or may not be true. This but is structural it, anthropology. Yeah, structure, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, it's like whether it's true or not. The way I feel about these things is like no one interpretation, and this is what Hein and Wright come to no one interpretation includes everything that we call ritual. Uh, or excludes it. Or excludes it, right. All of these perspectives, um, you could see as a, a sort of a shifting focus from foreground and background, and that, that moves around. Uh, so, uh, you know, really taking that, then we've got this other problem And which is that um, there's a tension in our society uh, around uh, around ritual and, and an aversion to it, yes. or we think there's an aversion to it. That's a question whether there's really an aversion or we think there's an aversion <laughs> because we we choose. Uh, we, you know, we just choose other rituals. Like checking your email. That's yeah. a ritual. That's what that we do not avoid. <laughs> yeah. Checking our uh, email or watching uh, baseball or, you know. Uh, and is there a hunger for it as well? And well, that's the, the question. Yeah. You know, but the original, uh, you know, the, the sort of thread of Zen that comes through the beats, which I think still lives and breathes in many of us, particularly yeah. uh, if we're older, is, uh, uh, you know, it's a thread of, of crazy wisdom and anti-ritual uh, and, uh, you know, what in religious terms would be called antinomian, mm -hmm. uh, which means uh, freed by grace, you know, by, not by her. Um, <laughs> Well, although maybe we are. Yes. <laughs> Where did she go? <laughs> she ascended, um, freed, freed by grace from moral law, you know, which is a big from moral law. From moral law. Yeah. Right. It's Weird. like it's like, hey, we got the that's crazy wisdom. Yeah. You know, no. freed by grace, and that's the problems that <laughs> speaks to the problems that you know we're having with some of our teachers. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's not even necessarily that they believe in it, but we do. We bought into it. Right. Because there's this understratum of uh, in our of of this kind of wildness in our notion of Zen. And even deeper possibly. Right, possibly deeper. And human nature. Let's just say that's not all bad. 
yeah. deeper, deeper than what chaos, is. chaos, deeper than our cultural. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Well, wildness is not chaos necessarily, right? Mm. Right. Well, mm. it means something to somebody. It's it's interesting because when you start reading yes. the stuff about ritual, what you find out is animals. I was, I've been thinking, yes. Yeah, she Grace brought that up yesterday. Mating yeah, rituals, so whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They've got they have quite elaborate rituals. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously they're not thinking of this in you know, in terms of structuralism or formalism, you know, it's like <laughs> what I yeah, yeah, what ideology do you subscribe to, says one horse to the other. Um, but but they have them, and that's part of wildness as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not that ritual is is outside of wildness. Um, but just to recognize, again, to recognize we have this, this stratum within us that we might not be fully aware of. And I, I just, I, I'm not sure that I, I said this, I was thinking of it. Uh, uh, it's not all bad at all. It actually means we're alive. That wildness is also our life. And if we try to refine all the wildness out of it, I don't know. It, it, well, first of all, we can't do it. We'll go crazy. And second of all, who wants to live that way? But how do we contain it? And this is what, what Suzuki Roshi said. Uh, you know, in saying to take a, uh, another look at Zen. And he was kind of a pioneer coming at, coming right out of the beat time and introducing us to something, to something else. So he said, uh, he describes Zen as a very formal practice with a very informal mind. What's an informal mind? It reminds me of something Grace that I've been thinking about that Grace described when you, when, what I would call digest your neurosis or something. She said it's circulating freely. Does anybody else remember that? It's like I've never thought about it that way. I always sort of think you digest it and then eliminate it, right, or something. But it's sort of like it's circulating freely. It's not getting stuck anywhere. Without any obstructions. And, and it's not getting stuck anywhere. You may not be expressing it. You, you're deciding what the appropriate expression in any given moment is, and it may not have nothing to do with what's circulating in terms of your own anxiety or reactivity or anger or whatever's coming up, you know. And it seemed connected to what we were saying, and I've totally lost. Well, let me take it someplace that's okay. Uh, I think about uh, one of my favorite books uh, is uh, by Lewis Hyde. It's called The Gift. Yeah. Uh, people know that? Anyone know that? Oh, it's really great. Uh, and it talks about, he talks about from a psychological, religious, and anthropological perspective of the giving of gifts, of giving, of dana. Uh, and the gift is, in his way of framing it, the gift is alive as it circulates. Uh, and you know, the gift must always move. It, it must always it move, it right. Is. So the same thing, if our neurosis is not going to be, when, when you stop it someplace, mm. then it's toxic. Mm. Then, it, then it really uh, harms us and distorts us. But if you allow it to circulate, and the same thing with gift, when, you, when the gift stops moving, it's dead. And valueless, and becomes subject to greed, mm -hmm. uh, and subject to delusion. It becomes objectified uh, in our minds. Uh, Which was why they got, came up with that phrase "Indian giver," because the Indians kept things moving, and right. when they give things to the white people, they wouldn't they be them. giving them, and they would. They were like, "What the heck are you doing?" <laughs> and that was called Indian giving. <laughs> Back or expecting you to give it back or whatever. 
So I just want to go a little further, if, that, if that's OK. Um, I was listening to public radio, and I heard, it's like I was waking up, and I heard some report about this woman, Francesca Gino, uh, who is a, who studies ritual, and she had she they, they talked about two studies of hers which I thought were really interesting. One was uh, uh, rituals enhancing consumption. <laughs> 